Amen. Well, just, um, can I just do a sidebar on um, the Oka thing? I think it'd be really good. One of the things which I think would be really good to encourage um, us to do is in the workplace, in your communities and so on, why not take a lunchtime or a coffee morning or something like that and um, invite one of these Oka students to come and just basically tell your friends who you invite along, just say, look, this is an opportunity to ask all any question you've ever wanted to do about Christianity. And there's someone who will actually probably be able to answer them quite well and um, just specifically do it for that and I think in lunchtime meetings in, in at work in the city Canary Wharf wherever it is um, in your community um, gathering neighbours together it's just a great opportunity to um, take advantage of these people who we can really um, nail in terms of um, opportunities to ask people questions they're absolutely brilliant they're experts in that I want to just read um, a quote from um, one of the books I was reading for this, um, for this talk is uh, Christopher Hallowell, who um, writes about fatherhood. He's an American man. He wrote this. Fathers are curious people, aloof and mysterious, popping in and out of young lives, often having in common a reputation for being distant and preoccupied with their own affairs. One of the things about fatherhood in our nation is we've lost the plot. We, um, if you think about so many areas, there's so much training uh, around in, um, you know, to learn to drive, to um, learn to be an accountant, to learn to be a teacher. Um, our children are being educated like mad and to doing things which um, are extraordinary um, and irrelevant um, uh, for some things. <laughs> um, but actually, in the one thing that... Um, many men in our nation have to do is to learn to be a father. And we have no training in this. You are thrown in as a father into, um, into this extraordinary responsibility that, um, just like mothers, we have no preparation for. And one of the challenges in our society is that where we used to have um, a much more of a community where um, families grew up together, and they stayed close geographically, and you learnt from the, from the older generations. Nowadays, we just don't have that. We are separated from our own um, parents of, by cities, by huge distances, sometimes by countries um, internationally. And so we um, have to learn on our own. And there's not a lot of help out there. But actually, I think that even where it was done in community, that quote is actually quite relevant for um, every generation that's has been through the nations and through our own time. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. I want to just begin by, just um, remember Rod two weeks ago talking about marriage and how he talked um, just at the beginning um, of this section at the top of the page, um, verse 21 of chapter 5. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is the context that Paul is writing about in this chapter. And he's saying basically, this is the way things need to be in the Christian family. We submit to each other, we serve one another, we love one another. Every relationship needs to have that at its heart. And remember Rod drawing our attention to the fact that Paul singles out three particular groups. He singles out um, uh, fathers, husbands, and masters, masters over slaves. And he says that these people have power over um, the, the people they are um, relating to, and they, ha they are singled out with special attention. And it's almost like a call, not just to submit to each other, out of reverence for Christ, but to go the extra mile with these people who have power which can be so easily abused. And in this case, fathers have power over children which is so easily abused. That's why Paul begins to say in verse four of chapter six, do not exasperate your children. This was radical for its time. Fathers had absolute power over their families in Roman times. Um, they had absolute power over their children. And Paul here is, is opening up a new paradigm, a new way of thinking about fatherhood. It is a mutual responsibility. Um, parents must behave responsibly 
towards their children, which means no longer being harsh. That was the pattern before. No longer provoking children if they're just in the way and getting annoying. And if you think it was just then, actually, the, the, do you remember the Victorian um, adage, you know, that children should be seen and not heard, and better not seen as well? Um, actually, that wasn't that long ago. But even now, children um, either have too much power or have no place at all, depending on which context you're in. So we, we, need to, we keep on getting it wrong in our society. We need to keep on addressing this and trying to get the balance right. But the reason he's saying don't do this, don't exasperate your children, is so that they don't become bitter and rebel and run away. So I just want to look at um, a couple of aspects for fathers here. Then I want to look at something which actually applies to every one of us in terms of how we might take the attributes of fathering to um, father one another and then to actually think about that connection with God our Father and actually how that begins to impact and flow through our lives. So first of all, um, the encouragement Paul gives here is to make a heart connection with your children. Do not exasperate your children. Why is this particularly addressed to fathers? Well, one writer said this, that mothers are much more patient. They have a divine patience, whereas fathers are more liable to be carried away by wrath. Well, maybe that's true. Um, Colossians 3.21, there's a parallel um, verse here which Paul writes to the Colossians. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. You know, the plague of youth in our generation is a broken spirit. So many places in our nation, there are young people who have been broken, broken by um, uh, overbearing, particularly <coughs> fathers. They've been discouraged by continuous criticism, by rebuking, by too strict discipline. And this kind of works its way out in two ways, I think. First is um, trying to control our children. That's this um, power over them. And it's easy to annoy our children. I just find myself sometimes um, just annoying our children. <laughs> and I just kind of go a bit too far with um, teasing, which then turns into annoyance. annoyance. And, um, you know, I, I reflect on that myself and just think, you know, why am I doing that? And sometimes it's exercising power for the sake of it. Pushing our children into a corner which they can't get out of. One commentator wrote this, that there are three ways we can do injustice to our children. The first is that we forget that things change. So the customs of one generation are not the same as the customs of another generation. You know, um, you, know you might find yourself saying, I was never allowed to do that when I was a child. But our children might equally respond, well, that was then and this is now. Actually, that's true. Video game consoles did not exist when I was being brought up. This is a different ball game. We have to try and work out how things apply today, which actually we, we didn't even have um, a shape for in our minds of uh, when we were growing up ourselves. We forget too easily that things change. We apply the same rules then as now, and it doesn't work. Secondly, we can exercise too much control. By doing that, effectively what we're doing is we're not trusting our children to learn as they grow up. Um, when we don't trust our children, actually, it leads to bitterness. It leads to resentment. And too much trust is probably better than too much control. Although fear means often we'll go to too much control. But there's a delicate balance that we need to learn. Thirdly, I think we forget the duty of encouragement, encouraging our children. Um, have you read The One Minute Manager? It's a great little um, booklet by Blanchard and Johnson. And they write this, which I think is really relevant here. Help people realize their full potential. Catch them doing something right. We need to praise our children. We need to go out of our way. If we're not very good at it, we need to go out of our way to, to encourage and praise our children for the smallest things. I, as I was reading this, one person said some, that they, their own teenage um, 
uh, child has just their bedroom is a bomb site, and um, it had it'd always been quite untidy. But as they got older and older, it was becoming this um, uh, kind of dangerous zone because it was so smelly and horrible. And um, he said there are three ways you can deal with that: either you can put a, a notice saying "danger, do not enter," um, or you can uh, just ignore it, or you can try and be creative with encouraging a different approach. And in the end, he, he, the only thing he could say is, "Wow, your ceiling's really tidy." So, <laughs> whatever it is, try to encourage. So that's one way, um, trying to control our children. Actually, we don't need to do that. The reverse encouragement and giving um, uh, safe freedom. A second um, area with, uh, with exasperation, which is slightly counterintuitive, but I, I think it leads to the same reaction, is by being absent. And how many of us know absent fathers as being an issue? Um, have you seen the film Hook? The, the, the kind of relic was probably quite old now, but um, uh, uh, Robin Williams plays um, a businessman who is um, uh, who who becomes Peter and has to go um, kind of through time in order to uh, save his own children. But it's a U certificate film. But there are many fathers who say it's the scariest movie they have ever seen. And the reason is this, that um, this character, um, Peter, is um, a businessman who is over busy. And he has all kinds of, you know, he's passionate about his family, but actually his business begins to take over. The time begins to kind of ebb away at his own family time, time and life. And so he finds himself on the phone a lot during um, at home when he uh, has already left the office. Um, he'll take a phone call during a meal or at bedtime when he's reading to the children. And there's one point where he's late for a game. He's promised he's going to be um, there for his um, family. And... Um, Another game which he promised he'd be at for his um, son, he eventually sends an intern to video it so that he can watch the results, um, you know, watch it later on when he's able to because he's not able to make um, his promise. And um, there's one point in the film where his wife Moira says this, your children love you, they want to play with you. How long do you think that lasts? Soon Jack, his son, might not even want you to come to his games. We have a few special years with our children when they're the ones that want us around. After that, you're going to be running after them for a bit of attention. It's so fast, Peter. Just a few years and it's over. And you are not being careful and you are missing it. It's so easy to be absent when our children need us. And it's not spending enough time with them. Very simply, we need to make a priority for these few years that we have our children. And that means um, uh, doing things which are sacrificial for us. So there's one um, family in this congregation where um, uh, the, uh, the father had the opportunity to get a promotion. And he said, no, I'm not going to take that promotion. I want to, I'm going to move sideways just for this um, time so I can um, spend more time with the children, just be able to get home um, in the evening in time for their bedtimes. And actually, the interesting thing is that um, just for that five-year period that he made that decision, he was able to do that. And he's now in a position where he has just got promoted and he's in a much stronger position, ironically, because of um, actually being able to be uh, having that extra experience at that particular level. But making those sacrificial choices will make a huge difference. One classic thing that um, Rob Parsons, this is a great book if you haven't read it, if you're a dad, actually if you're a mum, it's worth reading as well. The 60 Minute Father by Rob Parsons. He just says, no one was ever heard to say on their deathbed, I wish I'd spent more time at the office. Fathers, we need to be careful that the time that we spend, we make a choice to come home on time, we make a choice to prioritise our children. Um, again, in this book, uh, Rob Parsons makes this um, devastating comment. You know, the biggest lie we can believe is that a slower day is going to come. Next week, things ease up. In a month's time, I can just see my diaries clearer. And the truth is that that never happens. Our lives become busier and busier and busier. And the time to spend with our children is now, 
We must seize the opportunities now. Another book which is really helpful um, by a man called Danny Silk, Loving Your Kids on Purpose. And his um, whole, uh, uh, I guess, thesis behind this book is that actually by making a heart-to-heart connection with your child, that is the way to have long-term uh, intimacy with your children. And you know, they need that heart connection. When that heart connection is established, um, you don't need to exercise control because there's a natural desire to obey. There's a natural desire to submit to your authority. Um, and uh, that heart connection is our goal, isn't it? To have that heart connection with our children so that they want to spend time with us. Um, when those moments, I mean, they want to spend time with you now, but there'll come a time when they might not choose to do that. But actually, if you've built that heart connection, they will choose to spend time with you. If that's our goal, everything follows. Time, encouragement, blessing, a vision for fatherhood. These things flow naturally out of this heart connection with our children. So that's the first thing. Don't exasperate your children, but instead build that heart connection with them. Secondly, we need to seize the initiative for discipling our children. The rest of that verse. Instead, bring our children, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. We need to teach our children to follow Jesus. I've met many people who say about their children, I'm going to let them decide whether to follow Jesus or not. And I have to say that that is not what God encourages the people of God to do. God's encouragement to the people of God is to train and instruct your children in the Lord. And don't leave it to chance. Don't leave it to the, um, the, the pulls and ties uh, and tugs of the world to draw your children away from God. You know, it's a bit like um, saying, uh, you know, to a relay runner, um, you know, they've run the first lap and they're handing on the baton to you. And you say, actually, um, I'm, I'm not going to bother. I'm just going to go back to the beginning again and try and run that race, that part of the race again and run twice as much again. It's, it's just it's meaningless. We take the baton that we've been passed and we pass it on to our children. We teach them to follow Jesus. Just keep a, um, your finger in um, Ephesians and turn back to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 6 is on page 177. So um, this Deuteronomy is a book of the law. It's a book of um, encouragements on how to please God, how to serve him. And the encouragement here, chapter 6 of Deuteronomy, page 177. Verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Verse 7, impress them on your children. Do you remember Louis last week as she was talking about motherhood, saying that um, one phrase that uh, her um, sister and brother-in-law used to, uh, about the wedding of their daughter was almost like a blessing to the children. We want your, um, your flaws to be our ceilings. So we get so far in our lives, but we want them to start from where we get to. Our ceilings, as far as we're able to get, we want that to be the starting point for our children, their floor, so that they can go on to see great things that God wants to do in and through them. So we want to encourage our children by reading the Bible with them. It's really important for fathers to take the initiative in that. Um, Pray with them, read the Bible. We, we found that it, the pattern has changed over the years as, as kind of bedtimes evolve and so on. But to try to do a Bible reading with them daily is really, really good. And for some who it's just impossible because you have to work really, really late, choose that time at the weekends where you can spend time reading the scriptures with your children. 
discuss the Bible, discuss moral um, issues that are age appropriate over meal times. Um, work out, you know, for us, for our children at bedtime, the, it's like the rush of the day is slowing down and oft, often things begin to tumble out from the day that um, the children just want to talk about. And we're able to put that in the context of actually understanding what God has to say about that as well as our own encouragement and affirmation to them. And what is this? What are we talking about? This is an all-of-life discipleship for our children. And fathers, do not distance yourself from that responsibility. I think mothers are brilliant at it, that nurturing, that caring. But sometimes it's so easy just to let them do it. And actually, you must take a lead. They will look to you for that lead in the future. And I think the one way to think about it is how can we encourage our children to grow to be more like Jesus. Do you remember that character description in Galatians the, um, where Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit? It's a character description of Jesus. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. These fruits that grow in our lives... We want to encourage these things to grow in our children's lives. We want them to be more patient. We want them to be more loving, more kind, more full of joy. These are things we can encourage and nurture in them. I think just um, when we think about the vision of the church, up, in, out, forward, loving God, up, loving one another, in, loving our neighbours, out, loving our city and um, having a legacy for our city, um, forward. We, um, th- these are ways we can train our children. How can you love, your, um, love God more? How can we encourage our children to love one another more? How can we encourage them to love their neighbours, whether it's in the school or just physical neighbours? How can we encourage them to serve their city, love their city? Different ways to think about what we can encourage our children with. And I think it's something which happens over a lifetime. Um, Nikki and Sila Lee's book, The Parenting Book, which is absolutely brilliant as well. It's uh, the parenting course, which I commend to you. We're going to be running that in the autumn. Um, but one of the things that they talk about is the different uh, times that um, different ways of parenting are, are needed. And for us, we were, um, uh, we were just beginning to really struggle with um, some of the behavior of our children in particular situations. And eventually we went back to the parenting book and we realised that we had read, um, we thought we'd read it, but we'd just skimmed the, that we'd got as far as children naught to 10 and we'd um, uh, skimmed kind of 11 to 13 and 13 um, onwards in teenage years. And we, as we began to read the 11 to 13 part, which is really the heart of where our three children are, um, suddenly it was like reading oh my goodness, this is so encouraging. This is like a description of all the things that are going on in our home at the moment. And there was a need to actually parent in a slightly different style. This is the way they sum it up. Setting boundaries is about naught to tens. Letting go gradually, about 11 to 13s. And guiding without alienating is more about the teenage years. And that's so liberating when we get equipped in that way, but also just to recognise that there's something different for each age group. And we need to encourage each other. Dads, we need to be encouraging each other and actually helping each other to grasp how to um, understand the unique challenge for our particular age of children. Discipleship is still a principle of what we're doing, but it changes as the years go by. Um, I think it happens even when children leave home. There's still a role for the father. And actually, the, the, the extent to which you have that heart connection with your children will be the extent to which you will relate, be able to relate to your children when they're older as well. And they will come to you for advice um, and encouragement and uh, you know, if you have that heart connection. So making that heart connection with our children, seizing the initiative for discipling. Thirdly, I want to just um, talk about recovering the gift of fatherhood um, in the church and across the church. If you think about what discipleship is all about, it is being really a spiritual father to those around us. Would you like to just turn to 2 Corinthians? Sorry, 1 Corinthians, chapter 4. It's on page 1082. 1082. (laughs) 
Paul here writes some intriguing words. Verse 15. Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, I've sent to you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. So Paul here is basically saying it's, it's easy to be in a church. This is quite a big church that he was writing to. And not you know, to be really into spiritual things, perhaps these um, uh, 10,000 guardians in Christ might have been talking about guardian angels. It's not exactly, um, we don't know for sure. But he's saying actually you can have lots of spiritual things going on, but you don't have any spiritual fathers in your midst. And spiritual fathers are people who we can relate to, we can look to and say, would you help me to grow in Christ? Would you help me to be a, a better Christian? Would you help me to follow Jesus more in my life? And I think in our individualistic age, we need to recapture this across the church. We need to recapture that, both that desire to be mentored, to be discipled ourselves. That means actually asking, approaching others and saying, would you help me? Would you pray with me from time to time? Would you read the Bible with me from time to time? I'd love your help and support and encouragement. But also being able to offer that to others who might ask that of you. Even in it, sometimes actually offering it to people proactively. We want to be careful that it's not kind of heavy in any way, but I think that's not our problem at the moment. It doesn't happen very much at all. And we can be encouraging that. We can be looking for a spiritual father for ourselves, someone who's going to encourage us, someone who's going to point us towards the Lord, someone we can imitate, like Paul is saying to um, those people who he had um, established in the church. Discipleship. I love the way he says about Timothy um, in 1 Timothy 1. He says, you are my true son in the faith. How many people might we be able to say uh, ourselves of that? You know, you're my son in the faith. I've encouraged you. I've led you to Christ. And I've spent time with you encouraging you to follow him. I think there are, if you do do that, and I want to encourage you to do that, here are two simple paradigms to think about. Um, if you meet with someone, uh, I use five questions when I'm kind of thinking about these kind of things. And these are the five questions. Um, uh, how are you? How's it going? <laughs> are you okay? Are you well? What's going well in your life? Second question. What's going well? What, so third question, what's not going so well? Fourth question related to that is, what are you going to do about it? And the fifth question might be, how can I help you? Simple questions you might have in the back of your mind as you're encouraging and discipling someone to be a follower of Christ. Another one is actually when you open the scriptures together, choose a few verses. When I first became a Christian, um, a, uh, a, a man's... I met up with another guy who was just, um, he was a student, I, was, I became a Christian at university, he was one year ahead of me, and we got up, I thought this was normal, but I found out afterwards it wasn't so normal, but we got up every morning at seven o'clock in the morning, I was not used to that, but this is, he said, this is what you do as a Christian, you get up at seven and we meet together and pray, and we went through the book of 1 John, verse by verse, it was so helpful, and just um, asking these questions, what does this verse say, what does it mean? And how can I apply it to my life? Three simple questions you can ask of any Bible passage. When we do it with someone else, we can be asking those questions of that person, just talking about it simply and encouragingly. How can we do that? How can we stir that up? Well, it begins perhaps in connect groups, but it also can be, you know, if you're not in a connect group, get, find some kind of spiritual father. You can say, look, would, can we meet up? Can we pray? Can we read the, um, the scriptures together? And when we do that across the church, that will be an acceleration of our spiritual life massively. It'll be really, really exciting. One final thought um, uh, then in this whole subject of fatherhood is I think the encouragement in general through the scriptures to, encourage, to encounter the father heart of God. Um, 
just turn back to Luke chapter 15. And this is a beautiful picture of what our Father God is like. It's on page 990, 990. And this is the parable of the lost son. In fact, it's probably better described as the parable of the two lost sons. Because there's one person who um, flees home, he takes the inheritance, he runs away um, from his father and family and squanders all of his um, wealth on wild living. The other brother um, stays at home but is bound um, by a legalistic relationship with his, um, with his father. And he's just as lost in a funny kind of way. But when the younger son finally realizes, he comes to his senses and he says, I need to come back to um, my family because even if I'm just a servant, it's going to be better than the situation I'm in. He turns back, verse 20, on page 991. So he got up and went to his father. And listen to this. This is what our father is like in heaven. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms round him, and kissed him. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him, was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son. He threw his arms round him, and he kissed him. This is a description of what our father is like, our father in heaven. When we were still far off, when we were still far off, whether that might be um, we're totally um, alienated from God, or even just there's a, a moment, even as a follower of Jesus, where we've, our hearts have become hardened. But when, when we're far off and we just begin to turn, he runs towards us. This is the, the Father who... Um, just needs the, that moment of um, uh, ex- that, that, that thing in our hearts that just says, I'm going to do this. He will take the smallest sign, the smallest turning, and run to meet us where we're at. He will um, greet us with compassion. He understands and knows us as we are. He understands the situations we face. He understands the things we don't even get about ourselves sometimes. He runs to us and throws his arms around us and kisses us. That's um, just a sign of intimacy. Sometimes actually even our own fathers have not treated us like this. But this is a God who loves us. He knows us. He wants the best for us. He wants us to know a deep security in who we are and who he is. When, um, uh, I've talked about this before, but when I was um, growing up, I went to a boarding school and um, I experienced some bullying which really just shut down my emotions. I remember just um, uh, crying in front of uh, my housemaster, who's the, the, uh, the teacher who looked after us um, out of hours, and bursting in tears on him. And I just made a decision in my mind, I'm never going to do that again. And so I, there was part of my emotional life just shut down. And after I'd become a Christian, I spent some time with the evangelist Jay John. I was working with him as his assistant. And he kind of used to meet lots of uh, kind of... Um, experienced Christians, shall we say. And he would always say, you know, can you pray for my assistant, Rick? He's got a real emotional problem. <laughs> and so he'd have all these people kind of laying hands on me and praying for me. And um, uh, I was actually welcoming that. I just thought, you know, I've, I've, there's a hardness in my heart that means that I've shut down to something which God needs to heal. And um, after a year of people praying for me, um, it took that long to kind of soak in, um, I spent some time in Hong Kong where someone prayed for me. And I, I remember it vividly as a turning point for me where um, as I was being prayed for, someone laid their hands on me and asked for God's Holy Spirit to come upon me. It was, um, I, all I can say is I encountered God's, uh, God's um, love as a father. 
And it was like being, like this experience of the lost son being wrapped around, having God's arms thrown around me and um, him kissing me. That's what it felt like. And I just remember tears uh, of emotion just um, pouring out of me. For, I mean, I was just, everything was drenched and it was horrible. But it was, within, it was the most wonderful, wonderful experience and liberation as I experienced the true love of God my Father. And from that moment, actually, it changed everything, the way I viewed people, the way I viewed um, uh, the world, because I had a deep security in who I was. I didn't need to prove myself to anyone anymore. And I was able, actually, to give love that um, I wasn't able to before, because I'd received love. And, um, you know, the writer John says, we love because he first loved us. When we've experienced that love, the love of the Father. We're able to give that love away to others. So with that, let's stand and let's pray together.